thank you to Dean Lee for inviting me. And I'm always honored when uh, the faculty shows up for a lecture. It's <laughs> uh, very, yes. Uh, I understand that, there, that uh, there are many computer experts in this part of the country. So one of them should adjust this projector because see, it looks much better on the screen, right? <laughs> You're not seeing the background of this image. <laughs> So could somebody, but, but seriously, before I start, could somebody adjust the uh, contrast? If, if, you could look at the, if you could look at the computer, but while it doesn't matter so much, uh, I, let me begin anyway. Uh, um, while, there, while somebody's fiddling with the machine, uh, let me say, this is the quote by uh, Aristotle, the Greek philosopher, is uh, 2,000 years old. Uh, it's important to read it because when he made the statement, almost no one lived in cities. Uh, less than 5% uh, of the human population lived in cities, and yet he said at that time, uh, somebody who's got a city somehow is, a, is a, a kind of a less uh, of a human being. Well, today, uh, more than half of the 6 billion people on the planet live in cities. Uh, it's a rather remarkable transformation that has taken place just in the last half a century, and we still don't fully understand the implications of becoming a human species. Uh, for example, uh, 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 America was urbanizing very rapidly throughout the second half of the 19th century, uh, building some of the first very modern uh, buildings uh, and cities. Uh, it took 100 years uh, between 1820 and 1920 for 27 million people to come to live in American cities as they were growing in a remarkable way. It took one year uh, in 98 for that many immigrants, uh, immigrants, uh, rural immigrants from China to move. So the, the rate of acceler the acceleration of urbanization is one of the truly astounding characteristics of the age in which you are living, we are living, and especially in this part of the world, uh, which is urbanizing so rapidly and radically. Um, we're actually at a somewhat of a different point in urbanization between the West and uh, uh, the East here. Uh, we're not urbanizing very much anymore. We're not growing very much anymore. Uh, we're trying to find a way to kind of improve our cities through slow growth and through avoiding disinvestment uh, as opposed to, it's always a shock to come uh, to this part of the world and see how rapidly uh, cities are transforming. I hope that the rest of us, it's, I hope that it's not so dim because otherwise, uh, you will miss most of the presentation. <laughs> but, yeah, well, it's a little better. You should keep looking at the computer. <laughs> Maybe I'll turn the computer towards the audience. <laughs> uh, so uh, you are building cities like this uh, in this part of the world. This is uh, Shenzhen, truly a, a city overnight. We are building cities like this. Uh, our problem is a complete disaggregation of urbanism. So when you visit the United States, don't think New York is uh, an example of the way Americans live. New York is, is very unique, or Boston or Philadelphia. 90% of the development that takes place in America right now takes place in this kind of condition. But we now understand the limitations of this kind of condition. Uh, we have to find a way to move a little bit towards this direction. And of course, uh, you probably are trying to find ways to disaggregate a little bit given the uh, substantial uh, congestion of population takes place in cities uh, on the east. Uh, so it's, uh, there is no such thing as a world expert in urbanization. The mechanisms that you need to build this kind of city are very different than the mechanisms that build uh, this kind of city. So, yes, keep making it darker. Yeah. Oh, that's all right. Uh, it was just a background. Uh, it's, it's just a background. It's getting, this is, it's not so bad. It's, uh, Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, okay, so that's probably all right. Maybe it's, yeah. Now I, understand why this, now I understand why this is such a strong engineering school because you can fix things right away. <laughs> anyway, uh, at the end of the 19th century, uh, this is a view of Chicago. Uh, at the time, it was a little bit maybe like Shanghai or Beijing. It was the fastest growing city in the world. It was building very, very big buildings. Uh, it was experiencing all kinds of a substantial uh, modernization. Uh, but Americans actually never liked this kind of view. They almost immediately began to recoil from this kind of view and began to build a very different kind of city. 
Um, so it's important to understand that uh, uh, for most of the 20th century, American urbanization really has been a form of disaggregation from the city, moving out into peripheral areas, because this was per perceived to be perhaps a little bit inhumane. Uh, so American urbanization at the end of the 19th century, or the beginning of the 20th century, was reacting against the kind of the London and Berlin and Paris of the 19th century. If you read Charles Dickens or other authors, they talked about how awful life was in the industrial city. Uh, and this was our response to this. Now, of course, with concern about environment, concern about energy costs, concern about all kinds of asocial behavior, we're trying to move back in this direction a little bit. And of course, uh, in your part of the world, uh, perhaps there's, a, there's a, a need to kind of move slightly in this direction as well. So let me show you some uh, more characteristic views of America, uh, not the ones that appear in postcards, uh, but the ones actually that are more typical. 90% of all new construction in the United States takes place uh, not like this. This is what you think American cities are like. It takes place like this. And we're starting to, uh, of course, experience the consequences of that. And just a few more images. Right? Look at uh, the city of Baltimore. A uh, hundred years ago, one of the largest cities uh, in uh, uh, the United States. Uh, it's now actually much smaller than it was a hundred years ago. Our cities, many of them are shrinking, although the metropolitan areas are growing. So 1900, and then look at this, 2000. Uh, now, there are less people living here than there was a hundred years ago. <laughs> And more people, of course, uh, of course, completely moving out and sprawling out uh, in a rather unfortunate way, in some ways, across the larger landscape. And these are just a couple of more views, right? Uh, and they maybe don't require much more comment than that. Uh, so we've created a situation that now we find very troublesome, which is that uh, you, 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 work, you live somewhere here, you shop somewhere else, uh, you uh, enjoy life somewhere else, you work uh, somewhere else. Uh, a completely disaggregated uh, kind of existence. Uh, now we want to learn, you are always trying to learn from the West, we're trying to learn from you about how to build cities. <laughs> and that's very important to understand. Uh, all right. Uh, this is one of my favorite images. Uh, we also build much too large, which is one reason why our, our, the economy right now is going so badly. This actually is a house from the 1950s, a very typical suburban house from the 1950s. Uh, this is the addition to that house, all right? Um, uh, and it's not so unusual. The typical house now being built is about uh, 2,500 square, 250 square meters, very lar much larger than most people need. Uh, this, of course, is a, what we call a gas guzzler, a car that doesn't, that doesn't uh, go very far without gas. Uh, and so whereas, of course, the suburbs built in the 1950s all were more uh, humble, if you will, uh, we're now experiencing the downside of uh, overconsumption uh, and over-reliance uh, upon very large things. Now, of course, you could say, why would anyone not want to live in a house like this? Of course, it's wonderful. You have your own land. You have a, a, a very sort of gracious place to live. The problem of our suburbs is one of multiplication. So uh, if this is wonderful, maybe this is a little bit less wonderful, uh, and then this becomes a little bit less wonderful in many, many ways, uh, especially in terms of how it taxes the environment. Uh, so at a moment in time now, we need to kind of try to find a way to reconcentrate. Uh, and there's much concern about how to do that effectively, as opposed to disaggregate. Uh, and that's quite different than what is being experienced, for example, in uh, China. Uh, Detroit was once the fifth largest city in America. Uh, and you, kn you know it because it was the kind of the home of the automobile. Well, guess what? The automobile came uh, and the automobile left. Uh, and as a result, uh, this is what happened to Detroit. Uh, if you travel to America, again, after you visit New York and after you visit Las Vegas, come to Boston too, then go to Detroit because you'll be shocked uh, to see a place that has been largely abandoned. We tend to build better new things uh, than repair old things. Uh, and for a while that seems to be very uh, characteristic of our economic progress. We are now learning perhaps uh, that that's not so 
uh, terrific to sustain over time. So Detroit in 1950 was two million people, uh, about the size of Taipei, let us say. It is now less than a million people uh, and shrinking even faster. Uh, but of course, the outlying areas uh, uh, are growing very fast. So uh, there's Detroit back in there. <laughs> But most people, of course, now live out on the periphery. So I show this to you uh, as a prelude uh, to showing some of our projects, not because uh, I'm doing anything dramatically different, but to, I think people have a very, different, very, um, a, a, a very wrong impression about the nature of American urbanization. What you most admire probably is what was built quite a long time ago. Uh, now, of course, again, people love cars and love highways and love, and love uh, uh, single-family homes, but we now are realizing, again, uh, the kind of ultimate consequences of that kind of lifestyle. So uh, what are we trying to do about this? Well, uh, in the United States, uh, and these probably are fairly f would be fairly familiar here, these are the kind of six or seven ways in which planners in the United States are now trying to uh, recover from this kind of environment, build something a little bit differently. I don't think that I need to read all of these things. Uh, and some of them, as I say, are probably not so surprising to you. Uh, we're trying to conserve open space as opposed to abuse it. Uh, we're certainly trying to kind of uh, provide higher densities, uh, although there's a resistance to this. We're trying, of course, to reuse brownfield sites as opposed to always go on to greenfield sites. Uh, but it, the progress is slow. Uh, it is very slow. Now, uh, this actually is the cover of a 1930s, our last depression, not the current depression, of a government document. And what is that government document telling you? It says life by the square foot is bad, and life by the acre is good. So in fact, over the course of the 20th century, uh, government policies have encouraged, in many, many ways, uh, encouraged us to go from here to here. The result, of course, does not quite look like this, but looks like this. So if we believe that life by the square foot uh, has been great, but maybe too much now. We want to live by the square foot. Of course, life, life by the square foot or by the square meter is not very good either. Uh, so in fact, other parts of the world, in fact, continue to live life by a square foot and under very unpleasant uh, uh, circumstances. So this is why urban design is such an uh, interesting field, because uh, you can't use the same formula to solve or address this kind of problem, to address this kind of problem, to address this kind of problem. Uh, cities are very different from one another. And we should guard against making them all the same, actually. Uh, and so as an urban designer, you have to remain very aware of the differences in cities as opposed to look for some kind of universal formulas to try to make them all the same. We also live in a very unequal world. Uh, in the 19th century, there was actually a kind of a, 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 a in the large cities at the time, there was this notion about the city of hope and the city of, dis, of, of despair the city of affluence and the city of a lack of affluence. Uh, well, this still is with us very much today. Uh, nearly half of the three billion people who live in cities uh, live in what you would call slums. Uh, and again, trying to do something like that, uh, trying to fix their lives is very different than trying to worry about the next Bilbao Museum uh, or Guggenheim Museum. So I, I, uh, as, I, as I always feel that uh, because I come from a somewhat privileged background and in a, live in a privileged environment, uh, that the responsibility should not forget uh, dealing with uh, much of the world that lives in uh, very, very bad uh, conditions. So when I mention the territories of urban design, uh, uh, people think urban design is some kind of singular discipline. Uh, it's actually not, in my opinion. It is a kind of a concern for urbanization. Uh, and so sometimes urban design deals with the architecture of the city. Uh, sometimes it tries to repair existing cities. Uh, you could call that restorative urbanism. Uh, of course, it has to deal with public policy that supports uh, uh, healthy urbanization rather than, of course, uh, poor policies. Uh, uh, in, in the United States, we now have this little title called smart growth 
Why is that? Because we think that most of the growth uh, in the past has been kind of dumb growth, not very sustainable growth. Uh, urban design also is involved with infrastructure. Urban design has to be aware of real estate because so much of development actually takes place through uh, the private real estate market. Uh, there's a new understanding uh, also that there's a great relationship between landscape architecture and urbanism or planning. We used to think that landscape and urbanism were two different things. People in landscape just planted things or made gardens. Of course, much of the world really is a landscape. Uh, and so uh, urbanism fits into landscapes and all urban designers have to have some understanding about uh, uh, natural systems. Uh, urban design, of course, in many parts of the world is also about listening to the community and listening to, of course, the advocacy that comes not from mayors only or from leaders, but also from neighbors uh, and citizens. Uh, and of course, finally, which is why all of you might be interested in urban design. Of course, it's also a way to kind of envision the future. Uh, so the point of these images is to remind me uh, that urban design is not a singular function, that to deal with cities like this, to deal with cities like this, to deal with the kind of the iconic or uh, edified portions of historic cities, to deal with uh, nature requires different sensibilities. And that's what's so exciting about being an urban designer, at least uh, from my standpoint. So I think I will stop for a minute and have you translate, <laughs> word by word, of course. <laughs> and, then I'll sh and then I'll show some of our projects in, in the office. Don't you worry about it, I'll say more to you. And, and, <laughs> and may I take off my jacket, is that permissible? I may be taking off my shirt in a minute, too. <laughs>
。而如今呢，呃，现在当时光在底特律就有两百万人，现在在底特律的市中心少于一百万人。那各位可以看到，当时呢，看看可以看到那个房子被拆毁了。那可是另外一方面，在刚刚还有很多马里兰等等的这个来讲，城市不断的人在往外扩张。那这绝对会产生问题，在产生这个问题的时候，我们因此呃就要靠都市设计这个工具跟这个方法来解决。那这些策略呢，它刚刚列下很多，比如说我们要呃尽量保持都市空间、开放空间，然后要控制都市成长，诸如此类的事情。不过在这些事情的背后，可能我们要意识到的是，关于都市设计，它没有一套标准的公式或方法。它本身并不建立在这样的状况底下，它其实是而跟每一个城市所处的各种状况，也包括地理的，也包括人文的，也包括生产的状况，都一直会不同。所以它列出了 urban design 这这么有趣的这个呃呃工具或者是这个学门，它会处理什么事情呢？它当然处理城市的建筑，它处理这个呃。呃，来来这个处理公共的政策，他处理所谓的这个呃呃智慧型智慧的成长 smart g r o w t 然后还有成长上的掌控，这个呃呃 m a n a g e m e n 呃处理，还有当然都市设计跟这个都市之间的关系是一个基盘建设的关系。那么这就好像我们在过去还有另外一件事情，我们喜欢把景观跟跟都市。呃，设计视为两者，其实他现在我们才突然了解 ，landscape 跟 urbanism 是是一起，所以只有最近这十年来的 landscape、urbanism。那另外还包括它有跟这个房产有关系，那当然要跟社区有关系，跟社道有关系。那它当然也是关于这个呃修复现在的都市，还有这个、呃、对于未来的人的想象还有预期。那这是都市设计这个学门所有趣的地方，跟它今天我们认为它可以涵盖的，跟它为何不是跟所有的呃差异性呃来来有关系来做这个差异来做的这个研究来做出发，而不是寻求一个普通的统一的一个解决方案。那这就是这个呃 Professor Alex r i e g e r 他现在的啊。那接着他会以他自己事务所的案子，先以建筑的来说明一下，接着就会提到这个他是他目前在呃世界各地所从事的都市设计工作。More than you would want. Yes. Actually, right now, I I wish that urban design could control air conditioning, but but that's not one of its usual responsibilities. I'd like to. Show you some of the work of the office because uh, beyond theor theorizing, of course, it's about what you can do uh, in your own work. Uh, the real reason I'm here is because I was invited to come by Jennifer Lee, Dean Lean's daughter, uh, who uh, works has been working in my office, a very talented young lady for the past five years, and I wanted to show her dad. I wanted to show <laughs> her dad the work that she uh, has been doing. So I'm, I'm going to show a couple of our architecture. I'm going to show a couple of the architecture projects in the office, but spend most of the time uh, talking about uh, uh, talking about the urban design work. I want to show about five or six urban design projects, really planning projects. A couple of them in China, uh, a couple of them in the States. Uh, uh, but I also we do three things in the office. We do institutional buildings. This is a hospital that, in fact. Jennifer Lee worked on was a key person on. Uh, we do most often urban design work. Uh, this is for a city of Shenyang in northern China, Shenyang, right? Uh, and we also do campus planning, master planning for campuses. I want to show you one of those. Go quickly through a series of architecture projects and then spend most of the time on this. And you may not need to translate all of this until we get to these projects. I think, okay? Because th this will be much more or less, more more or less uh, self. Uh, descriptive. The most interesting project that we have in the office right now uh, is uh, for a, un a brand new university campus. I'm looking at you, uh, including its academic, its 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 curriculum uh, for Botswana, which is a country in South Africa. It's just north of South Africa. Uh, uh, Botswana, the, s the small town of Maun here, uh, is at the edge of the world's largest uh, uh, river delta. 
Deltas usually come out and uh, move out into the ocean. Uh, this is the, the world's largest dry delta. So uh, every spring, when the, rain, when the rains stop and when the water from the mountains come down, millions of animals, tigers and elephants and every other kind of a large African animal comes to this delta, which is what makes it a very, both a, uh, a heritage site, a world's heritage site, a UNESCO heritage site, also a major tourist site for uh, safaris. Uh, so we're, we are uh, starting to build the first university in Botswana, uh, and it, uh, the curriculum will be devoted towards environmental uh, knowledge. Uh, and so just a couple of images of what this place uh, will look like. Uh, we're just, the master plan has just been submitted. By the way, all of this becomes water. All this becomes water uh, every uh, a, a, a spring season. Uh, there's the sort of dormitories. Uh, of course, it's, it's even hotter there than here right now. <laughs> uh, uh, there's the kind of central uh, axis leading from the street, uh, uh, moving towards. And so, of course, in this case, you have to learn a lot about a very different kind of climate, not to mention a very different kind of uh, culture. Uh, but I'm most excited at the moment about this project uh, because of its sort of social good, if nothing else, the fact that it will be the first major university uh, for a, uh, a new nation, a newer nation. All right, uh, in terms of our architecture work, we don't do huge projects very often. First of all, America is not producing huge projects as much as, of course, uh, uh, these right now. But I enjoy small projects because you can actually do a better job than on huge projects, as all the architects in the room would probably acknowledge. So just to show you a couple, this is a very large project, uh, and I show this particularly for Dean Lee. Jennifer was the design architect for this. Uh, this is a cardiovascular facility uh, for a uh, uh, heart patients uh, in Boston. Uh, and uh, the most uh, fascinating part about this project is that all, every single hospital room in there, every single one uh, is fitted out for intensive care. So look at this. These, you don't, you never want to be in this room, <laughs> actually, right? <laughs> However, if you are sick, it's a pretty good room to be. So every single room in this hospital is fitted out for intensive care. Uh, uh, this is a different kind of hospital building, uh, a very, very close actually to the other. Uh, in this case, we had to preserve this building. This is a, a 30s school that uh, you know, we now are very much into preservation because we didn't preserve for so many years before then. Uh, and so we had to keep this building. It becomes the front door and a much larger building behind. We also had to kind of cheat. Uh, that is, uh, uh, this is new, that is new. Uh, portions of this is new, so we actually had to uh, replace portions of the existing building in order to kind of complete it. It was in very bad shape, uh, and then find a way to move from the old building to build a much larger facility uh, behind it. Uh, and that's, uh, uh, so between the old building and the new building is a, uh, the major lobby space that you can see. Uh, uh, this is a very small, but I think a very, uh, I enjoy this project. It's actually uh, I never get to use this project. This is for people who own their own planes. Uh, so when you fly into Boston and you have your own little plane, you come into a very small terminal. It actually doesn't look like it's at, at the airport, uh, uh, it is, but it is, uh, as you will see in a second. Uh, it's a very small building. Uh, you arrive here, your fancy car parks here, uh, and you wait here, and your little plane uh, comes in there. And just a couple more. This is a school a project just completed. It's actually an addition to an older school uh, that you can see behind there, uh, like this. And this is actually the scale of architecture we enjoy doing, uh, more so than big, big buildings. Uh, uh, this is a, a very interesting material called lead-coated copper. Uh, actually, Frank Gehry uses it in very expensive ways. Uh, this is used in a fairly inexpensive way uh, as a skin for this courtyard, very small courtyard around. Uh, and then uh, this is another project that uh, 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 Dean Lee's daughter has been working on very, uh, very much. It's a warehouse. It's not very distinguished in a way, except I think it'll be a very beautiful warehouse. Uh, these are, this is the same material that you have in street signs. This building, it's a, it's a large refrigerator for a food uh, uh, warehouse company, food delivered for poor people. Food comes here and then gets sent out to about 300 uh, uh, agencies around uh, uh, the, the, the region. Uh, so you will see uh, in next. So here it's under construction. It's not finished yet. It's next to a major highway. So all these little things actually 
uh, make this logo. This is the major logo for the building. Uh, so when headlights hit uh, this building, uh, they will see this logo. Uh, and uh, this is a way to kind of deal with what has to be a very inexpensive uh, a, a building otherwise. Actually, for a warehouse, I think that Jen, Jennifer did a very terrific job. And so I congratulate you as well uh, for being her father. All right. Uh, so again, I'm not sure you need to translate. Uh, you want to say? Please, OK, you know yeah. But now I want to shift to specific uh, urban design projects, right? So now let me turn to some specific urban design projects. If you now re recall some of the different definitions that I had for urban design, I'm going to try to address a couple of them uh, in terms of specific projects. I don't think I'll go through all of this uh, list, but we'll see how we go before we expire from the heat here. Uh, but first, uh, I want to talk about a, a very interesting project that we've been involved with in northern China, a city that is uh, uh, f facing explosive growth. Uh, now, uh, Shenyang is now about uh, five or six million people. It thinks it will grow by 10 million people uh, in the next 20 years. It's mostly north of uh, this river. Most of the city is north of the river. This is a high-speed train line that is going to go from Beijing. And so they said, well, this is where the next 10 million people should go. Uh, and uh, of course, that makes a certain amount of sense um, to say, yes, that's where they should go. Uh, 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 but of course, this is also very uh, fertile. This is farmland. Uh, this is uh, villages. Uh, uh, it is not simply empty land. Now, 5 million uh, 10 million people is five Manhattans. Manhattan is an island. Of course, New York is two million people. Uh, so we said, great. So you need to build five Manhattans. So we showed them how to build five Manhattans. This is actually the island of Manhattan, right? And the reason we did this is to suggest if you build at a proper scale and density, 
uh, you only have to use about 50% of the space, uh, and then you can preserve 50% of it uh, in, its in its current condition. And so it was a kind of advice against uh, a different kind of sprawl, sort of Chinese sprawl. If you look at the existing city, it just is kind of you know, un endless and more or less the same level of density. Uh, so we said, no, 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 think about this. Now, everyone in China wants to build Manhattan, so of course, uh, this, was, this was very well received. But the important thing about this is, again, to say, look, if you zone it properly, you don't have to spread 10 million people like that. You can actually do so in a way. So these are our, the five Manhattans, uh, uh, but preserving actually about 55% of the existing land, including many of the, it's, it's hard to see here, many of the existing villages as well. And what that means is that you have to, and so this is, again, I'm saying, look, uh, you can grow, but don't grow at the expense of the landscape. Historically, of course, the landscape was so important to Chinese culture in many ways. Now it seems to be completely sort of treated as, a, as a, uh, just a, a space for growth. So we said, no, 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 think about it so that you preserve as much of the landscape as you can. And so that means that you have to also organize it a little bit like Manhattan. So again, this is actually the Manhattan at the same scale uh, as Shenyang. And Manhattan is made up of, it's essentially a linear city, of course, because it's an island. It's organized along uh, linear transportation routes. The airport is down here. Uh, the uh, the high-speed train line will go here. So of course, we wanted to stretch these Manhattans from uh, the existing city this way, uh, towards the airport. It has its own park system. It, 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 in a sense, it's complete, uh, but it's contained as well. That's the advantage of an island. Uh, and so we said, you should think about doing something similar. That is, uh, this is about a nearly a two kilometer width, right? Uh, about a mile and a half. So organized along two uh, major boulevards, which will have transit along it. Between them, there would be the denser portions of the city. And as the, um, the residential portions, of course, would, would become less dense as it moves towards, of course, this preserve and this preserve. And whether they want to put golf courses there or keep farming there, it's important not to simply fill it up all with uh, buildings. Uh, so that, it's a very kind of simple idea. Of course, that's the central part of Shenyang now. Uh, and we're saying, fine, uh, that's your Manhattan. That's their Manhattan there. Uh, let's build several others, but not in a way to reproduce this very kind of chaotic and not very functioning environment. Uh, they're very interested in this idea. Uh, we're continuing to work on it. But whether, and of course, we talked about sort of compression rather than expansion, whether or not they will uh, actually uh, provide sufficient land use controls to achieve this, uh, I can't be so sure. Uh, we went to a certain amount of detail to show how the grids uh, could be organized. Again, so about halfway, uh, half of it in sort of denser development and then half in preserving uh, the existing environment. So this was our attempt to try to suggest a pattern of growth that simply doesn't uh, fill out whatever land is available because uh, that's not a very sustainable way to think about the long-term future as well. Uh, do you want to say something about this but very quickly before I move on to another one? Oh, you want me to keep going? Oh, OK. I'm done. <laughs> I'm done with this one. <laughs> I'm going to move on to another one. Yeah, maybe it's not so important, because this, the, the pictures probably tell most of the stories, and we can move on. Right. OK. Uh, this is a very kind of different uh, kind of a project. Uh, 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 that is, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, our work in New Orleans after Katrina, uh, the cat catastrophic hurricane. Uh, New Orleans should never have been built where it is. And it's also not savable. It will flood again. There's nothing one can do because, of course, uh, it is built in an environment uh, between uh, a, a, a series of levees that were built originally along the Mississippi and levees against this lake. So now New Orleans is like a dish. It goes like this. Even when it rains, it floods. It doesn't require a typhoon or a hurricane. Uh, for the past 100 years, they've built, of course, uh, pumps to pump out the water after a rain. Of course, when a hurricane comes, it's tough to pump out the water. So there's actually no way. Uh, the original French, uh, French settlement was built on the only natural high ground, uh, which is why it didn't flood. Uh, all these areas flooded, but you can see the Mississippi River edge did not flood, partially because that's the natural high ground through thousands of years of sedimentation and partially because the, these levees were the kind of the sturdiest and built a long time ago. Uh, so uh, it is very difficult to rebuild these areas because they will also, they'll be destroyed again. Not this year, maybe in five years or in 10 years. 
uh, the solution to New Orleans is actually to kind of uh, create reinvestment along the river's edge. And that was our assignment. Uh, most of the river's edge is obsolete port functions. There's a newer port built somewhere else. So this is a tr tremendous opportunity to take what would be the best land, in a way, uh, and make a new city there, a more, much more sustainable city. Uh, but of course, it's a very difficult thing to do because most people want to rebuild their homes uh, and are very suspicious about development taking place somewhere else. Very difficult political situation. But uh, we were asked then to uh, find a way to suggest uh, not how rebuilding existing homes, that's somebody else, how to kind of provide an opportunity for reinvestment in New Orleans. And so in our case, we said it should be along the stretch of the river. Uh, and so uh, we found this historic photograph of, of a major street that once sort of came out into a public space uh, next to the uh, uh, Mississippi River. And we said, that's a great model, actually. Uh, let's, take, let's find another seven or eight such streets. This street is actually this street. It's, it's a canal street. Let's find other important streets and find a way to make them go closer to the river and around then the edge of the river, of course, build uh, new mixed-use facilities. And so I'm just going to show you. I'm going to skip this. I'm just going to show you. And uh, wherever possible, actually destroy uh, these, which, of course, are also abandoned, and recreate the batcher the existing batcher landscape, which actually is much more is a much more intelligent way to deal with the edge, as opposed to with sort of uh, 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 concrete uh, uh, platforms. So uh, most of it becomes this, and then on a few occasions, uh, then it becomes a kind of a new center. So, for, for example, this is one of those major streets that currently stops right here. Uh, we have it end at a at a public space and new development all around it. And that's essentially the simple strategy. Uh, so uh, we illustrated it. So that uh, would be one node. Uh, you, you could see how they treated the river. Uh, they completely ignored the river. Uh, and so uh, we can't destroy all these buildings, of course, uh, but we're suggesting that people from here now would find a way through an addition to the convention center, move up uh, onto a level uh, this being a, a new hotel, and at least be able to kind of overlook the river. Uh, and so instead of the streets stopping way back here, so there's no consciousness at all of the Mississippi River, find a way to extend them out uh, so that the people can enjoy the river again. And these, again, are places where investment can take place, should take place, and so on. So uh, just as another one, another note here, uh, the extension of the major tourist area right now, it also stops. You can see uh, this is Jackson Square where all the tourists are to get drunk uh, every weekend. Uh, uh, you see they, they can't get to the river as well. So once more, a very simple device about extending it uh, towards the river and so on. A, 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 uh, two warehouses, mostly abandoned. Uh, you see terminates uh, two very beautiful streets, very green streets. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, the tactic there is simply just to cut the ends of those warehouses uh, so as to uh, allow then the vista towards the river. Uh, for example, now you, we, we even thought about just putting a glass edge to these warehouses so they can see all the chickens being frozen inside. But the important thing is then uh, to then look out and see uh, the bridge and therefore understand how close you are to the river. Uh, uh, this is uh, preserving some of these structures, converting them into, of course, uh, uh, usable facilities. Uh, this is a school that wants to build. It wants to build here by destroying, by demolishing these old buildings. We said, no, 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 this is an abandoned railroad track. Uh, what you should do is make the addition to the school a means to also enable to come over the tracks and engage the river uh, and uh, so forth. This is an abandoned ra uh, uh, army uh, depot. And this is where, of course, one could also create a substantial new housing. This, this would be a much more intelligent way to rebuild New Orleans. Uh, uh, but there's strong resistance because, of course, people want to rebuild the very same houses that were flooded. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, 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 we found about sort of 18 places along this stretch uh, for some substantial new investment to take place. Uh, and the, uh, the idea being that the, this is why it's called the Crescent Plan, uh, that is, uh, at various nodes here, here, there. This is the existing downtown, there, there, and there, then a way to kind of rebuild New Orleans in a much more intelligent way, we think. Um, but uh, it's very hard to convince people to do this as opposed to, of course, rebuild people's homes that have been destroyed. Should I keep going? Yeah, no, I... Oh, 
So you're telling me that not even a Harvard professor could convince them that they should... Could not convince them. You could not? <laughs> even a Harvard professor? <laughs> yes. It may take five uh, Harvard professors to, <laughs> to, to, to do something. Good job. Um, <laughs> did they go up as a key I think I'll just do uh, one more because it's uh, taking a long time and it's too hot. <laughs> and there are many, many more speakers. So I just want to uh, do uh, two more projects that I think are kind of connected or interconnected. Uh, and they are two big digs. <laughs> Uh, the rebuilding of two major uh, highway systems, one in Boston, uh, our ho hometown, and uh, a, a project that's going on now uh, in Shanghai. Uh, uh, about a year ago, we, we won a, a, a major international competition to redesign the Bund. Uh, and I'll talk, and perhaps all of you know, it's about a three kilometer stretch uh, where the old part of the city, the early 20th century part of the city, right across the river from the new city uh, that's, being, that's being built there. But before I talk more about the, uh, and so there's the kind, I'll show you some of this in greater detail. This is our uh, submission to this competition, which we uh, received a, a first prize and continue to work on, although in a very challenged way. Uh, but before that, uh, one reason why I think we were asked to participate in this competition was about a, uh, almost nearly a 20 year experience uh, in what in Boston is called the Big Dig, uh, which was to take this highway uh, our, uh, and put it underground and create a series of, sort of open spaces in its place. This is the highway built in the 1950s that separated our downtown from, of course, our uh, waterfront, our ocean front. So let me show you uh, uh, what this has become. This was, uh, this was a plan that we pr produced in 1988, uh, uh, tw literally 20 years ago. It's now more or less complete. Of course, what took Boston 20 years, Shanghai wants to do in a year and a half, and, and, they, and they probably will. Uh, uh, so uh, Boston, like many cities, like many cities that, uh, that you might be familiar with, uh, felt that building highways in the cities was a way to rescue them from civilization. The opposite happened. The highways allowed people to escape. So this is the construction of the 
that highway in Boston. It went right through here, as you'll see in a second. It cuts many, many buildings down uh, in the process. And some of them you can even still see today, it looks like they were just cut in half. Uh, so that's what the artery was in the 1950s. Again, this is the sort of the SWAT, whoops. Uh, this is the SWAT that it took. It didn't look green then. This is the highway corridor. Uh, and uh, uh, this is the, the, the proposal. Uh, a highway was built underground. Uh, it's finished now, and these, this is a, an early idea about a continuous linear park, and you'll see what it looks like now. Uh, just really complete. So for those of you who have not been in Boston for a few years, uh, uh, it's a rather remarkable transformation. Uh, this is one of the first parks that was put in place there uh, that we designed. It's one of the smaller sections of the artery uh, corridor. Right. Uh, so there's the uh, before and after. So this is what it looked like. So it looks like now. Uh, you can see the trees are still not very mature and so forth. You can see the highway uh, originally. And then you can see then uh, the continuous open space system. Uh, some of these parcels will be built in. A few of them will be built in eventually with sort of cultural facilities. Uh, all right. Now, what's happening now, of course, is that with the park system in place there, a substantial amount of additional development wants to kind of be close to it. This is a project we're working on right now at almost this sort of China-like in scale. Uh, it's only uh, becoming a desirable uh, location because, of course, of the proximity of this linear park. Uh, actually, this garage, again, some of you who have been to Boston might remember, this is a huge garage that sits right here uh, that will be demolished. Uh, in order to build uh, this uh, project right here, because it, this project wants to be close to, of course, the former highway, uh, now this linear park. Let me skip this. Uh, we've done a, a lot of work in Boston, of course. But it's always best to work in your hometown. Uh, this is our city hall, uh, city hall and our plaza. Uh, people hate it tremendously. It looks awful uh, most of the time. We produced a plan to try to humanize it. Uh, 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 by showing how it might become more green, by adding a street that historically existed uh, there, uh, in, in encouraging additional uh, development there to make it more mixed use, and rebuilding what is a very horrible train station, uh, subway station here, uh, by creating a, a, a linear corridor right there to help define a much smaller space. Very little of this has happened so far, except for one edge, uh, which is this arcade that now at least sponsors a market there uh, on most uh, of the months of the year uh, and at least brings people into what was formerly a very empty space. Uh, and uh, uh, the original idea for this arcade was that it was going to anchor, or rather at either end of it, it was going to be two new subway stations. Uh, this was supposed to be built last. Of course, the way things work out, it was built first. Uh, uh, and now uh, we're finally, this is almost like seven years later, uh, starting to work on the, uh, uh, the new uh, subway stop as well uh, at either end of this arcade. So I just showed these to you. Uh, I'll skip this to, to talk about this, which I showed yesterday in a conference in Taipei dealing with uh, uh, the idea about a museum of urbanization. Uh, I show this because I think it's a very different way to think about uh, understanding a city. Boston has been... Uh, uh, filled in over time. It was originally almost an island when it was first settled. Uh, now you can see it, it's there now. All this was water, was water. So it's an interesting story to tell. You can tell it by putting it in a museum, or you can try to allow people to understand it on the ground. So uh, along several paths like this, we're build we've built these uh, markers, these historic markers, uh, to tell the story. And you can see they're very popular. Uh, people stop and stare at them. For example, this marker tells a little bit about the old city, tells about what happened there, tells about the, uh, the, the where you are in the current map, tells a story about important events that took place there. And one of the kind of interesting things about this is that it's part of a sort of a tri triangle of information. Uh, in our public library, there is an exhibit uh, devoted, a more tr traditional exhibit or conventional exhibit devoted towards uh, uh, of course, uh, the history of the city. Uh, but uh, when you walk the city, you encounter these things. You actually, this is a map that you can actually see the original of inside. You can open up your uh, iPhone or iPod and begin to kind of dial a number, and you'll hear more information about this thing. And we also published a book that tells the same story. So we think that uh, as opposed to simply a building to collect artifacts, uh, if you want to build a museum for urbanization, one has to kind of think in a more multiplicitous way. Uh, all right, so there's the big dig. Uh, 
uh, in Boston, uh, and this is, of course, our, our submission for the, uh, for the competition, and I'll stop with that, okay? And then uh, you'll have to invite me back for the other great projects. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so uh, many, perhaps many of you have visited, I'm not sure. This is, of course, the old, elegant China, built, of course, by the French and English uh, at the time that China first opened to foreign trade. Uh, this was the major sort of port area. Over time, of course, 12 lanes of traffic uh, grew in this direction. Uh, so like in Boston, most of these lanes, and right now there's a tunnel being built, uh, to place all that traffic underground, a four-lane street, a normal city street will be built right there, which will allow the promenade itself, the actual the bund, to expand substantially. So this is our this was our proposal. Uh, it was in six segments. I'll talk about each one of them uh, independently in a second. Uh, but I want to spend a moment here. Of course, this is the kind of historic evolution of the bund. You can see how originally uh, the water came much closer, and of course was filled in. We were very, you can see the difference. Now it's all, all these lanes of traffic in a fairly narrow wet, wet place for the public to walk. Uh, across the river, of course, is the kind of future city, the kind of grand city where the 100 story buildings and so forth are. We were very interested in, in recreating not the piers themselves, but the sense about many perpendicular connections between, of course, the city and, of course, the river. And you'll see how we try to kind of reinstate. Uh, these as, as design components. This was a kind of an, an early little sketch saying, yes, all these arrows are still important. In fact, the, the absence of them makes the bun a little bit inaccessible uh, uh, out there separate from the city. So uh, we devised sort of three different conditions. This is the existing condition. This is a levee. Uh, this is the promenade. There's, this has to stay, of course. Uh, so right now there's that many lanes. Actually, in a couple of places there are two more lanes. Uh, so we're using three devices. In some cases, this is the four-lane road, which replaces the sort of ten-lane road. The tunnel would be below here, right? Uh, in some cases, we simply kind of extend uh, the lands create a landscape that slopes up towards, of course, the promenade. In other cases, we actually uh, pivot it in the opposite direction to create a slope that allows people to look out over the river uh, and. Uh, create a series of shops uh, that then create more of a boulevard quality along this. And in other places still, we simply create, recreate those little uh, piers, not as piers, but as places that allow you to get up to the top of the levee much sooner than you can now, uh, because of course this is all now traffic as well. So now I'll show you uh, these things, uh, maybe without much comment. This of course is an existing war memorial. We didn't do much with that, but the first step was to restore a Chinese garden that had been fairly brutalized by kind of recent uh, 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 lack of maintenance for it. So that's sort of the first piece of it. Uh, and you can see that there. We proposed a little footbridge here, which will not be built uh, because you cannot go from here like that because this is the Russian embassy and so this is not public. So we proposed a little footbridge to allow this to continue. That's not going to be built. Actually, it turns out very little of this is going to be built, uh, only because uh, they want to finish by the expo in 2010. So they're doing something very basic, and then they say they'll come back after 2010. They want to finish the, the tunnel, and they're going to put a, a sort of a basic landscape in place and then come back after 2010 and hopefully do more of this work. We'll see. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, this is a very famous individual, a friend of Mao, a mayor of Shanghai. He had to stay. He had to stay where he is, uh, and so we created an open. Sp this statue exists, so we have to kind of create a space around uh, him. All right. So this is uh, this is the Nanjing Road terminus. Nanjing is the principal shopping street, uh, 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 the principal shopping street of Shanghai. So it would terminate in this sort of public space, and these stairs would then allow a more gracious way to get up to uh, the promenade. We also are proposing this very long trellis. Uh, for two reasons, maybe three reasons. One is, of course, when you're further back on Nanjing Road, you don't see the river. Uh, you just see Pudong in the background. So this trellis would sort of, in a sense, identify where the river is uh, with, those, uh, with those kind of grand steps uh, then leading up uh, underneath it. Uh, and the other purpose of a trellis is to provide, of course, uh, let, me go, let me go forward. Uh, is to provide a shading device. There's no shade there. And for a climate like, uh, like uh, 
uh, uh, Shanghai, it's kind of foolish. So this shading device would allow the lower level to uh, continue to develop in these little shops that exist there, but also allow you, if you want to, on the upper level, for part of it to move under a, a, a shaded environment. And we, we, uh, so there, that's a view from, of course, the top of the promenade looking down. The former one was looking from uh, below up above. And we kind of stole a little image from actually a Norman Foster project in Nimes, Paris, to show what the space uh, underneath might, uh, might be like. Uh, and then periodically, uh, we introduce these sort of long perpendicular pathways that then point to, of course, the other monuments along uh, the process. Uh, my favorite part of uh, this scheme is this section here where we kind of rotated the landscape. We pivoted upwards. Uh, these, these, uh, these lawns pivot upwards to create, in this section, a sort of a, two, a, a, a more confined street environment. Uh, you can see that here, right? So this slopes up, which allows these areas to become shops, which was part of the program. Uh, and also, in between them, allows uh, these ways to come back on down uh, to the promenade. There's a sort of a more a detailed view. So a portion of this long stretch becomes a more of a formal boulevard with tree planting in the center as well. Uh, uh, you can see a close-up here. Uh, and then you can see the difference right now because there's so much traffic and for other reasons you can't, you, it's not very often you can even look down onto the street. So we're destroying all this stuff because it's really unimportant to create these uh, uh, berm areas and allow people also uh, participate in these uh, amazing historic structures. Uh, a portion of it, a long portion of it, is simply the sloping of the ground plane upwards to connect to the Bund. Again, with these long diagonals, this one stretching back to Nanjing, Plaza and uh, the mayor of Shanghai statue. This one aiming towards, of course, another monument that is our own invention. Uh, let me skip this part. Uh, let me skip this part. Uh, the, 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 the levee is very high, so you ha don't have a feeling of being able to get close to the water at all. So we proposed in this, uh, there are existing boats there now uh, that are being moved further down uh, river. So we proposed a sort of a barge system uh, to allow people to get closer to a stationary barge closer to the river itself. So you can see uh, you, you'd walk up to this uh, up existing primary and across onto this uh, device uh, and with a swimming pool in the center of it. Now, this may seem kind of stupid, uh, uh, unusual, but wouldn't it be wonderful if you felt like you could swim in the river there? Another, so you can see you've, you've come across at, this upper, at the height of the levee, and you are now on a little island. Uh, and then, of course, you can also swim in here as well. Now, uh, it's another idea that we stole. Uh, look at this. This is one of the most amazing uh, public swimming pools anywhere. It's in Sydney, Australia. Uh, this river has sharks in it. You don't want to swim there, right? Uh, but you feel like you're participating in this river environment. Uh, this is in Denmark, something similar. Uh, this actually is literally a barge in uh, Vienna. So we thought that that's the purpose uh, that this, uh, as you walk along the promenade, that this floating kind of swimming pool uh, might be like a different. Uh, we try to enhance the different experiences that might occur along this uh, three kilometer stretch. Uh, and then. Uh, <laughs> And then lastly, uh, the promenade kind of keeps on going and sort of falls apart uh, uh, now. Uh, and it, it simply bypasses a very important historic temple and what is called Old Shanghai. I'll show you in a second. So we thought that there should be a monument here that sort of answers this monument and allows people to move into this old temple grounds uh, and into Old Shanghai. Uh, we sort of suggesting tearing down a couple of very uninteresting buildings here to extend, this is an existing park, uh, to extend the park and connect it to the Bund. Uh, this also will not be done in the immediate future. So we sort of created this sort of bookend condition between this monument and this monument, and then this would be a way to get over to the temple and old Shanghai. Old Shanghai is uh, not really so old, uh, but it's a very, you know, very active tourist area here. Uh, and from here, you can see with the tall buildings in Pudong, but you have no way of getting there whatsoever. Uh, so the purpose of this last bit uh, is to kind of, again, uh, to create this uh, new pathway uh, and with this marker to and allow people to move back and forth uh, 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 to this area. Uh, and so this is the idea, right? That you could walk from old Shanghai through this park towards this uh, structure and then get onto the Bund environment itself, right? So that's the, uh, 
that's the uh, that's the expo ground. Whoops! I'll just show you some of the details as they're developing. That's the expo grounds. Then this is the uh, the, the Bund itself with our little sort of second memorial. Uh, anchoring that three kilometer stretch. Just a couple more images and then I'll stop. I just want to show you some of the emerging uh, much more detailed ideas as a consequence of working on it since the, uh, the, uh, the competition was completed a year ago. Uh, much more substantial planting uh, uh, involved. Uh, in a couple of places that we had to change the original idea, uh, for instance, uh, they did not want, for some reason, steps leading up from Nanjing Plaza up to the promenade. So instead, there's going to be the world's longest sort of, uh, living wall uh, right there. Uh, uh, it will be, uh, of course, like a sort of a, like a terrarium. There's a French uh, artist who does these things, and this is what it might kind of look like. Uh, like that. So as you walk towards this plaza, it would be uh, uh, this sort of living wall uh, that then you move around. There's, of course, the, the friend of Mao having to sit where uh, we couldn't move. We proposed moving him slightly. That couldn't be done, which eliminate the possibility of these, stair, uh, these stairs here. Uh, further on down, also it had to change because uh, uh, they thought that they needed more paved space. We proposed all this to be green. They want more paved space for some reason. So instead, we created this kind of long uh, wall, which will have a certain uh, character, it will also be illuminated. Those are the components of it. So you, uh, the, the new street, uh, beautifully paved, uh, small set of steps. Uh, this actually covers a maintenance building, moving towards this sort of other wall, and then up uh, onto the promenade itself. Just a couple of more images of what that would be like when you would see it uh, lit up. Uh, and then these are misters uh, uh, laid uh, in the ground so during the hottest season. It's not a water fountain, it's misters to provide some uh, aeration for the environment. Uh, I was going to show you two more projects, but I think given the time, uh, I, I think I'd like to hear Shu as opposed to continue to talk, to, to, to hear myself talk. So thank you very much. Uh,
另外还包括呃这个原道的这个呃呃大的这个呃轴线公园，还包括了外滩草坪，然后很有意思，从那个呃水上的运输轮船发行的一个浮动的公园，那么在浮动的公园上面可以餐厅，甚至可以游泳池等等。那最后，如果这个呃呃这个另外一个最后的收集的这个观景塔是从老上海庙这边。旧城的这个 shopping 的这个写拼的这个区域，就直接连到这个新的关系台，那因此呢，来作为这个呃新的上海的各种可能性。那么呃，在讨论的过程当中，他呃前面我也忘了说，他曾经他在呃 Boston 所做的各种展览的空间，接着这个各种展览的空间的处理，甚至可以用 iPod 或 iPhone。